the afternoon session with two algorithmic talks. The first one by Shelby and some uh, new primitive using span program. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks to the organizers for putting together a great workshop. Um, so today I'm going to talk about path detection and why it makes a good quantum algorithmic primitive. And this is based on a series of work with Stacy Jeffrey, Michael Jarrett, Alvaro Pedrafita, Kai DiLorenzo, and Teal Witter. Okay, so when I talk about a quantum algorithmic primitive, what do I mean? A quantum algor algorithmic primitive is just an algorithm, but it should be kind of a tool or a building block that can be used to design other algorithms. So it should be widely applicable, and ideally it can kind of be used in a block black box manner. You just have a black box that accomplishes some algorithmic tax, task, and you can easily understand the behavior of that box without having to kind of open it up and deal with the innards of what's going on. So kind of the prototypical example I think of a quantum algorithmic primitive is Grover's search. Um, it's widely applicable. There are many algorithms that use search, and it's very easy to characterize how it's going to behave without having to you know, worry about exactly how the algorithm works. You just know that if you're searching a list of n things, that'll take classically about time n, but quantumly you get a square root speed up. Okay, so why is it important to think about algorithmic primitives? Well, I think one, one reason it's important is to make quantum algorithm design more accessible. You know, as we're starting to build better and better quantum computers, more and more people are interested in thinking about how problems that they're interested in can, t can use quantum computers for an advantage. So a lot of people are asking that question, but I would say not a lot of people actually want to learn about quantum mechanics. They just want to kind of understand how they can use, the, plug in this tool. Um, but if we can provide quantum algorithmic primitives to the community outside of quantum computing, that they can just use these tools as, as black boxes, and as long as their problem has the input that kind of is allowed or is required by the black box, they can get a sense for how a quantum computer could potentially speed up their problem of interest. And I think it would be a really good thing to have a wider community of people working on understanding what quantum computers can do and how they might speed up different computations. Uh, but I think it's also important even for expert algorithm designers to think about kind of compartmentalizing what quantum algorithms can do. I mean, we heard in Richard Kung's talk earlier this week that he had thought about designing his algorithm so that there was a bottleneck which then he could use kind of a, a quantum algorithmic building block or primitive to solve that one kind of tough part of the algorithm. And so I think that's we're becoming a more mature field. We don't need to design every quantum algorithm from scratch. We can start to use the tools that we've developed and think about how to combine them in interesting ways. So what I'm going to do today is hopefully convince you that a good quantum algorithmic primitive is this problem ST connectivity. So I'll try to convince you that it's widely applicable and it's kind of easy to use in a black box manner without having to um, look on the inside and deal with all the quantumness. So for the rest of the talk, I will introduce this problem to you. I'll tell you about SD connectivity, and then I'll talk about why it's widely applicable, and I'll talk about why it's easy to analyze. Uh, but just as a preview um, in terms of how widely applicable this is as a quantum primitive or subroutine, I tried to make a list of all of the problems where people have used this as a subroutine in solving another algorithmic prob problem. Um, so you can see for a lot of these, this using ST connectivity as a subroutine gives you an optimal algorithm. Uh, actually continues on to the next page. I'll just mention that this very last, okay, obviously you can use an ST connectivity algorithm to solve ST connectivity, um, which is the final thing here. Um, but I'll just mention that, that, that this algorithm that Reichard and Belovs first analyzed is the same one that I'm gonna be using uh, today, but with slightly more sophisticated analyses than what they originally did. But hopefully, at least just flashing these problems gives you a sense that this is a problem. This is a tool that can be used in a lot of different contexts. Okay. So what is ST connectivity? Uh, it's very simple. You have a graph with two nodes S and T, and you want to know are they connected. So in this case, the answer would be yes, and in this case, the answer is no. <coughs> okay. But what's really important whenever we're talking about trying to understand what a quantum computer can do, or really what any algorithm can do is we need to think about what the input is, because if the problem that we're trying to solve doesn't have the correct input, then we can't use the algorithm that assumes you have a certain input. Okay, so the input to this ST connectivity algorithm is a bit string, so 
you know, bits that can take value 0 and 1. And then also what I call a skeleton graph. So the skeleton graph um, tells you where edges might be in the graph. So we already know, for example, that there's no edge between these two vertices. So ahead of time, you know that some edges might be missing. Then for the edges that might be present, each one is labeled by one of the uh, names of the bits in the input string and, or by its negation. So then once we know the assignment of the bits of the input string, that allows us to assign edges to the skeleton graph. So if there's an edge labeled by 3 and x3 has value 1, then we put an edge at that position in the graph. Or here we also have an edge that's labeled by the negation of 3. So then when x3 is present, in the, if x3 equals 1, we don't put an edge. So every bit string now corresponds to a graph. And so if the input bit string were 1, 0, 1, in this case, we'd return yes, because s and t are connected. If the input bit string was 0, 0, 1, now we remove all the edges that correspond to 1, and we have a graph that's no longer connected, so we would output no. Okay. So that's how the, this is the input to the problem. And we assume that this bit string is initially hidden, and we can ask questions to learn what the values of the bit strings. So we could say, OK, what's the value of x2? And then if we learn that it was 1, then immediately we would, we would know that the graph was connected. So that's kind of the classical version of the input. Quantum mechanically, we're, we assume we're given an oracle that allows us to ask the same question. So we can ask, what's the value of bit i? And it returns that information in a quantum standard basis state. Uh, but it also allows us to ask this question in superposition for all of the elements of the input string. Okay, so basically from here on, I'm just going to assume we have a black box algorithm that solves this problem, which, I mean, I guess I don't have to assume. We do have an algorithm that, given this input, solves the problem of whether S and T are connected. And so I'm just going to be treating this like an algorithmic primitive. I'm not going to be opening up the box, I'm just going to be saying, now that we have this primitive, what types of problems can we solve with it? And then once we know that we can use this to solve a problem, how well does the quantum algorithm behave? And we'll see that it does quite well kind of in a large range of problems. OK, so the next thing we'll talk about is how, so uh, it seems like this problem ST connectivity, obviously, it's good at figuring out whether two points are connected, but how to, can you use it to solve other types of problems that you might be interested in? So I'll talk about why it's widely applicable. Okay, so we'll start with an example of cycle detection. And I'm using this example because this is something that I've studied, but um, it also is representative of how it can be used as a primitive. OK, so with cycle detection, we want to know, is there a cycle? So here, there's a cycle in the graph, so we'd return yes. In this case, there's no cycle, so we should return no. And the input to this problem is given to us basically in the same way that the ST connectivity input is given to us. So we're actually given a bit string, which tells us whether edges are present or not. OK, so we want to figure out how to use ST connectivity to solve this problem. So we can break up this bigger problem of asking whether there's a cycle to asking a slightly more specific question, asking whether there's a cycle that goes through edge 1. Well, two things need to occur if there's a cycle through edge 1. There needs to be an edge, like edge 1 needs to be present. But then also there needs to be a path from one endpoint of edge 1 over to the other side that doesn't go through the edge itself. OK, but now we can translate those two criterion into an SD connectivity problem. So here's the SD connectivity problem that corresponds to satisfying those two things. So there are two, we can kind of think about this as two subgraphs. There's a subgraph at the top, which is just a single edge, which answers that question, is edge 1 present? And then the bottom subgraph is the original graph, but with edge 1 removed, and asks if there's a path that goes from one side of edge 1 to the, the other. And when, because we want to kind of take the and of these two, of these two things, uh, we can connect the graph in series. So we're only going to get all the way from the top all the way to the bottom if both of these things hold. Now if we want to ask the question, is there a cycle at all? Well, that's, there's going to be a cycle if there's a cycle through edge 1 or through edge 2 or through edge 3 or through edge 4. 
Um, and so when we want to take the or of a bunch of um, problems and put that into an SD connectivity kind of approach, we can attach graphs in parallel. Because now if there's a path through any one of a series of graphs in parallel, the whole, you're going to have a connection. So here, the, there's kind of a subgraph on the left, which is asking whether, whether there's a path, a cycle through edge one, then whether there's a cycle through edge two, and so on. So hopefully, I mean, this is not too challenging with construction. Hopefully, it's clear that there's going to be a cycle in our original graph if and only if there's a path in our, we've converted that problem into an ST connectivity problem. And so now that I've done this, hopefully it also makes sense why one of the key um, applications is to uh, evaluating Boolean formulas. So Boolean formulas are just uh, evaluating the and and ors of a series of input bits. And so if you have, I've just said that, oh, well, if you want to characterize and, you can attach things in series. And if you want to characterize or, you can attach things in parallel. So if we just have a bunch of ands and ors, that amounts to creating a graph that's a bunch of edges connected in series and parallel. So this graph on the right exactly will have kind of S and T connected in the graph if and only if the Boolean formula evaluates to true at left. So, so there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between SD connectivity and Boolean formulas. OK, so I encourage you to take your, your favorite problem and see how to convert it into an SD connectivity problem. It's kind of a fun thing to do. Uh, but of course, so I th for many, many problems, you can do this conversion. But then the question is, would you actually want to do this? How well is the quantum algorithm going to do on evaluating these problems? Like, is this a good thing to do? Or maybe you should have a more direct approach that doesn't do this SD connectivity conversion. So let's talk about the analysis of the quantum algorithm. Um, but again, we're going to treat it just like as a black box and just try to understand its characteristics rather than getting into the actual functioning of the algorithm. OK, so first of all, the space complexity. So the quantum algorithm only uses logarithmic in the number of edges in the skeleton graph. So that's good. Whenever you have something that scales logarithmically, that means it's not going to take uh, use a lot of qubits to, to solve this problem. So given that building large quantum computers is challenging, this is a good thing. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the query complexity. Uh, so query complexity, because we're ha given this bit string that's initially hidden, the query complexity is the number of uses of the oracle that are needed to determine whether S and T are connected or not, uh, with high probability on the worst case input. Um, and so classically, that kind of corresponds to how many questions do we need to ask of the bit string before we can answer whether we're connected or not. So query complexity is a tool that's really nice to use because it allows us to compare very easily to the classical version of these problems. And it's also much easier to analyze than time complexity. But often, what we really care about is the time complexity. How long is it actually going to take to run? And so I'll say what we've shown is that um, the, the time complexity is just a multiplicative fact, uh, is the query complexity times some multiplicative factor. And that factor depends on the number of operations needed to implement a quantum discrete walk on the skeleton graph. And it also depends on a factor that goes like the spectral gap, spectral gap of the Laplacian of the skeleton graph. So you know, those things might or might not be challenging to implement. But at least if you know the query complexity, it gives you some kind of a sense along with a couple of other factors of what the time complexity is. And if you really care, you could try and figure out what those terms are. And that would immediately give you the time complexity. OK. But we're going to, for the rest of the talk, we're going to focus on query complexity. So the number of times that you need to use the oracle to figure out whether S and T are connected or not. The number of times you need to query the bit string, basically. So what is the query complexity of 
So what is the query complexity of this algorithm? So it is uh, scales like the product of two terms, uh, the square root of the maximum effective resistance of any connected graph times the maximum effective capacitance of any not connected graph. Uh, so what's really nice about this is that effective capacitance and effective resistance are terms that many people are familiar with, lots of physicists who have taken electricity and magnetism, um, and they don't, they don't necessarily, it's not like you're having to analyze or understand a lot of complicated quantum things. These are basic graph properties that are not so hard to deal with. And I'll, I'll get into a little bit what they are, more of what they are shortly. Um, but I'll just mention that the effective resistance part of this uh, formula was found by Belovs and Reichardt in their original paper, and that the dependence on the effective capacitance uh, is work that I did with some of my collaborators. Okay, so since we're gonna, we'll, we'll shortly look at an example, and we're gonna try to figure out what the query complexity is, and so we need to understand how to calculate the effective resistance and the effective capacitance of our graph of interest. So the effective resistance deals with graphs where we have a path from S to T. So to calculate the effective resistance, we can imagine having, um, we can imagine that all of the edges are pipes and we can have water flowing in at S and flowing out at T. And then a flow is any kind of, we can assign uh, numbers to each edge and we want to have one unit coming in at S, one unit coming out at T, and then the net flow at any other vertex being zero. So for this example, we have to have kind of one on that upper left edge, but then we can get a split into f and one minus f. So any, any value of f would give us a net zero flow across that split. Okay, but then given a flow, we can calculate what we call the flow energy. So that's, you just take the flow on each edge squared over all edges. And then the effective resistance is just the smallest energy of any valid flow. So this is a slightly def different definition than what You've seen if you've like the standard circuit model definition, but it's electrical circuit definition, but it's exactly equivalent. Um, so the, the value of F that will give us the smallest effective resistance is when we set F to be one half, when it kind of splits perfectly. And that's how electrons would flow in a circuit if you had two lines with equal resistance on them. So that's the effective resistance. So we would calculate this for every possible graph where S and T are connected, and whichever graph had the largest effective resistance, that's the term that would go on that left quantity. The term on the right, um, we look at all graphs that are not connected. So for every graph that's not connected, we can create a generalized cut. So for this, we assign values to every vertex. We assign the value one to S and zero to T. And then we can assign other, whenever there's an edge in the graph, we have to not change the value of the vertices across that edge. But here we have a vertex that's kind of free, that's not touching other vertices. There's no edge between it, so we're allowed to set it freely to be any real number. Then we can define the energy of this cut as we take the difference across every edge in the skeleton graph, square it, and sum that up over all of the edges. And then the effective capacitance is the smallest potential energy of any of these generalized cuts. So in this case, it would the thing that would minimize this cut energy and give us the best of the effective capacitance is if we set that value to be two thirds uh, at that free variable. Um, and this is again exactly kind of analogous to what you would get if you were looking at the effective capacitance of a circuit, um, where the cuts are kind of the the capacitance. Um, or the, the, the numbers there are giving you the voltage at each part of the circuit. Okay, so now that we have those tools we, and we know the query complexity, we can analyze how well our quantum algorithm is going to do on a problem of interest. So let's go back to this cycle example that we had earlier. So here's now our ST connectivity problem, and so we wanna know what is the worst effective resistance and what is the worst effective capacitance. So let's think about the case that there's a cycle with three edges. Well, that means there's going to be a path through every one of those subgraphs corresponding to each one of the edges. And each one of those paths is gonna be of length three. So more generally, if we have a k-length cycle, we're gonna have k parallel paths of length k. And if we're thinking about the flow, for the effective resistance, that's gonna give us a one over k flow 
on each one of those paths, that's going to be the best we can do. And so then when we square that and sum up over the, all of the edges, we find that the worst case effective resistance is always one for a single cycle. And if there's multiple cycles, that actually just lowers the effective resistance further because there's more paths that the flow can take and less flow going on each path. And so when you square it, it ends up being even better. So we have a bound on the effective resistance. The next thing is to calculate the worst case effective capacitance. Um, so in this case, the effective capacitance is always less than the size of the smallest cut. Um, and so in this case, it doesn't actually bias that much to worry about the details of the effective capacity of like, we can just assign numbers one and zero and not worry about assigning these intermediate values like two thirds, like we saw in the previous example. And then that just gives us a standard cut. And so in this case, uh, we kind of have two types of subgraphs. We have graphs where we have an edge being present or we have an edge not being present. So like in this example, two, three, four don't have edges present, so we can make a cut right up at the top. And there are order n squared subgraphs where we can make that cut right up at the top, because if there are no, we're now dealing with cases where there are no cycles, so if there are no cycles, um, at most we could have a tree with the n minus one vertices, or sorry, n minus one edges, so the rest of the edges are not present, so we can make those cuts. But in the cases where we do have edges in the graph, we now can't make the cut up at the top of the subgraph and we have to make the cut down below in that kind of larger part of the subgraph. And there we might have to cut up to n squared edges because that's kind of the number of edges that you need to cut in an arbitrary graph to show that two vertices are not connected. And so we have at most n of those uh, subgraphs where we have to make this n squared size cut. So the dominant factor is this lower uh, bullet point which gives us a cut of size n cubed. Okay, so we just multiply these two things together and we get that the query complexity is n to the three halves, which turns out to be optimal and also gives us a logarithmic improvement over the previous best uh, quantum algorithm and is also considerably simpler than the previous algorithm, which involved random doing, a, picking graphs at random and having some kind of Grover search over all these random graphs. This is just a very clean reduction to ST connectivity but kind of amazingly, just like the simplest thing that you might think of is the optimal thing, which I think is I don't know, nice. Maybe it tells us that this is a good approach. Yes? Uh, is it easy to compute, like in polynomial time, this uh, RS, like this maximum resistance and maximum capacitance if I give you the skeleton graph? That's a good question. I mean, so it's always less than the shortest length path and the cut is always less than the smallest cut, so that it, those are normally pretty easy to upper bound. But if it has some complex structure, and it turns out also you can add weights to edges, um, so you, it's not only figuring out what the best, what the smallest, or what the maximum effective resistance is, but like calculating what weights would give you kind of the optimal. So I think that, especially once you throw in the weights, I think it would be very challenging. Not actually. I th I'm not exactly sure. Maybe there's a quantum argument for that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> for effective resistance, we have quantum arguments. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> well, but, you, but in, to know how fast those would run, I think you need to know what the effective is like. If that, <laughs> you need to have a run, you know an idea of the worst case effective resistance. In any case. Um, I guess I wanna go back to what happens when we have more than one cycle. So if you have more than one cycle, that maximum effective resistance decreases because you have more paths. And actually it turns out that the effective resistance is always exactly equal to the inverse of the circuit rank. So the circuit rank is the minimum number of edges that you need to cut before there are no more cycles in the graph. And again, this is kind of beautiful. We just like came up with the simplest thing that we could think of for evaluating ST connectivity and out of it popped, out of this effective resistance popped this key topological parameter that characterizes the number of cycles. So uh, I don't know, again, it points to maybe this is the right way to approach certain types of problems. So what this also tells us is, is that if we're promised that either there are no cycles or if there are cycles, there are many cycles, then the algorithm runs faster and it scales like the um, inverse square root of the number of cycles in the graph. 
And another thing that was nice about this was that this resu result was proved by second year undergrads, one of whom didn't know anything about quantum mechanics. So I mean, I think when you, that's kind of the, the nice thing about thinking about these primitives is it really makes quantum algorithm design a lot more accessible to people who don't have a quantum computing background or a quantum mechanics background. Um, so, right, <laughs> um, as was just said, there is a quantum algorithm to estimate effective resistance and effective capacitance of the graph. But so what this does is it actually gives us an, another kind of interesting approach to algorithm design because if you can create an ST connectivity problem whose effective resistance encodes some quantity that you're interested in, then this algorithm gives you a way to estimate that quantity. So like in particular for our example, this just immediately gives us an algorithm to estimate the circuit rank of a graph. So again, kind of a nice bonus of converting to these ST connectivity problems. Okay, I'm almost out of time. I don't, I don't know if people like are dying, you know, maybe people are very frustrated with just having this black box and you're w wondering what's inside the blocks and it's, you know, it's a span program algorithm and there's a little bit of information about it. Okay. <laughs> But the point is we don't have to open up the black box. We don't need to worry about it. So um, I'll just end with a couple of open questions and current directions. So this question of how to choose edge weights. So it turns out for some, for some of these optimal reductions to SD connectivity, you only get an optimal reduction when you choose those edge weights very carefully. So figuring out a good way to choose um, edge weights, which corresponds to like putting on resistors of different resistance on the different edges. It's not clear how to choose those. Um, I, from that slide at the beginning, we saw that a lot of these reductions give you optimal algorithms, but are there certain conditions that we would expect, okay, if this type of problem will, we should get something pretty good from SD connectivity, this type of problem maybe we won't. If we had a better way of understanding the classical uh, time or query complexity for evaluating SD connectivity, that would Im immediately give us a way to just generate separations between quantum and classical algorithms. Um, so there, with the algorithm that Stacy and uh, Tsuyoshi have for estimating effective resistance, it has kind of a nasty scaling with the error. So it'd be nice to improve that. I think that's possible. And then also I would just encourage all of us to think about this idea of primitives and how it can kind of further the field by widening the field, by bringing more people into algorithm design, either through pedagogy or just through talking to our non-quantum friends. And with that, I'll end. So I guess if someone gives you a graph, how are you constructing like a, the optimal skeleton graph to like run your own? Yeah, so that deals with that conversion from query to time complexity. So as part of the actual running of the algorithm, you have to implement a quantum, basically a quantum lock on the graph. So you need to have some way of basically turning that skeleton graph into a quantum lock. So you know if you're at one vertex, you know which vertices you're allowed to hop to. So that's how you actually kind of encode it into the quantum algorithm. Okay, so related to that, so how would you quantify the complexity of implementing a quantum walk in this model? The time complexity? Query complexity. Well, so for query complexity, we assume, you know, we're not having, the structure of the skeleton graph is just given to us. That's something that we kind of pre-process ahead of time. So ahead of time we pre-process, we figure out how to do this quantum walk step. But the thing that we don't know is that, that string, that bit string. And so that's the thing that we're querying. Yes, so, so, I, so let's say that the skeleton graph is a complete graph, and then mm -hmm. sort of adjacency matrix model. Yeah, so, uh, right, oh yeah, so in the adjacent, it's kind of like the adjacency matrix model. So you could imagine that every, in this case, every single bit string has a unique edge, or sorry, every bit in the bit string has an edge that it corresponds to. And for the complete graph that the time, you know, because walking on the complete graph is kind of simple. You just go to all your neighbors. So in that case, the time complexity is, you know, the query complexity and the time complexity are the same. Maybe I missed this, but let's just say I want to uh, evaluate the size as Boolean formula, unbalanced case. What would the query complexity be using this SD connectivity framework? Square root of n. Okay, but you save the login factor also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, is that a decision answer? Do you get, can you get HR information? Uh, 
if it's connected, can you get some information about the path or? Yeah. About like the length of the path? Or what's the well, so if you use this uh, estimating the effective resistance, because the effective resistance is always larger than the shortest path, it gives you some information. Um, but I think there also is when you when you actually measure, you can get information about one edge on a path. So then that can potentially be leveraged into finding the path, say. So that's a way can you find the uh, path? Yeah. So so you can find. I think what you can do is you can find one edge on one path every time you'd run it. So then you could kind of go from there. I think uh, Ashley Montanaro has some work on, on doing that. Okay, I'll turn this question, because it's a sanctuary.